So I am Josh Day. Um, I am a fourth year PhD student in statistics at NC State. Uh, and my main research is into online algorithms for statistics. Uh, so we'll get into that quite a bit. Uh, if you're interested in following along at all, I have a repo with the slides up uh, on my GitHub page. Uh, but yeah, you can reach me. So my uh, GitHub uh, handle is Josh Day. All right, so first off, I'd like to talk about what's motivating this work. Um, <clears throat> so IBM released this infographic a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's the four V's of big data. <clears throat> so we have volume, which is the scale of data, velocity, analysis of streaming data, variety, different forms of data, and veracity, uncertainty of data. Uh, and so typically in a statistics education, we are basically able to handle the right side of this. So we see data that with, has different variety, uh, and we see veracity. So we're used to you know, um, different forms of data and missing values, and that's things statisticians know how to handle. Uh, but when it comes to volume or velocity, um, you ask someone to do a logistic regression on a terabyte of data, uh, most statisticians um, are going to go blank uh, and not be completely sure what to do. So statisticians don't have the tools to handle all of this, uh, and adapting our favorite algorithms are often non-trivial. So I'm oversimplifying things quite a bit here, uh, but these are basically the types of problems uh, we're running into uh, for these big data applications. So we have easy problems, uh, and these are things where you can update the parameter directly, uh, things like a mean and a variance. We have hard problems. Um, basically, we're updating some kind of sufficient statistic. Uh, that's in quotes because I'm abusing the term. Uh, from, which we, from which the parameter can be calculated. Uh, so like linear regression, you can calculate x transpose x and x transpose y, uh, and then solve for your coefficients. And then there's things that are actually kind of impossible. Uh, so there's no analytical solution, and we have to approximate these things. Uh, so these are things like quantiles and logistic regression. So introducing online stats. Um, so input data is accepted piece by piece, not all at once. Um, all the algorithms use constant memory, uh, and my goal is to provide functionality for all the major areas of statistics. Uh, so from summary, st summary stats to penalized regression. Um, and this is a bit of a lofty goal, redoing all of statistics for online algorithms, uh, but there's still quite a bit of features uh, in here. So first I'd like to talk about why I'm using Julia. Um, so this is the same story that everyone else is telling. Uh, so I'm coming from the R world, uh, and I had started writing this package in R and RCPP. Um, so with online algorithms, everything I'm doing is basically a for loop. Um, so I was using C++ to speed that up, and just development time was slow. Uh, I switched over to Julia, and just kind of, without even knowing the language, I was kind of instantly more productive. Uh, and my code was at least as performant as it was in R and RCPP. Um, and then I came across the at time macro, and that blew my mind. Uh, so I don't think I'll ever be going back. All right. So the basics of online stats. So everything is an online stat, which is the abstract type. Um, and all these things are types. So here, uh, every type has two constructors. Um, so you can construct objects with data. And by convention, um, data is accepted with observations in rows. Um, so if I give this means object uh, matrix 100 by 2 matrix x, it knows that I want two means of 100 observations and not the other way around. Um, or I can also create an empty object and add data later. So there I'm telling it um, I want to calculate two different means uh, from two different series. And all these types are parameter parameterized by a weight type. Um, so this is always the last argument of the constructor. Uh, and the default depends on whether the problem is classified, as I talked about before, as easy or hard versus impossible. Um, so the easy and hard ones are given an equal weight. Uh, and I'll talk about the impossible ones in a bit. So most things um, are given an equal weight uh, by default. Um, so this means if the online algorithm can be calculated the same as the offline algorithm, if, you can, if it's possible to get the same result, uh, using an equal weight is how you're going to get that. So consider an online mean. So many updates have this exact same form. Uh, so it's like a weighted average of whatever our parameter currently is and some new value. Uh, so we have these weights gamma in there, and we're updating our parameter theta. Uh, so for gamma t equals 1 over t, so updates are equivalent to the offline mean. So since updates are equivalent, we're going to call this thing equal weight. Uh, other types available are exponential weight. So this is where our, we're using a constant. 
Um, so this is where we want to weight uh, more recent observations have a higher influence. So we use a constant um, and we're able to update things. Um, or so we're able to kind of catch up on a model that's changing over time. Uh, there's a bounded equal weight. So there we start as an equal weight and then we shift to exponential. Um, so our gamma is the maximum of one over T or some constant lambda. Uh, and there's also a learning rate type. Uh, and my main use case here is for stochastic approximation methods. Uh, so these are for those impossible types, which I talked about before. Um, and so gamma is the maximum. So again, you can give it some minimum value that it gets to of uh, one over T to the R. And so R is typically between 0.5 and one. So you can think of the weights as somewhere between one over T and one over square root T. Uh, so here's a plot of those weights, what they look like. I don't know if you can read those, make that a little bit bigger. Uh, so the top left is equal weight. So that is one over T. Um, Jupiter is uh, displaying that a little strange. Uh, but so the top right one, uh, so that, that line should be constant across 0.2. Uh, so that's an equal weight with 0.2. Uh, there's a bounded equal weight. So here we're using equal weight and then we hit that cutoff and stay constant. And then there's a learning rate of 0.5. So this is using one over square root T as a weight. Um, so we can see how these things um, are going to, you know, allow new observations to affect the objects. So here's a quick example of why this weight stuff matters. Oh, and thanks very much uh, to Tom Breloff um, for making plots. So all the plots I'm using here is with plots.jl. Uh, and I'm also using the GR backend, which they're very, both very cool. Um, all right, so here is why we need to use weights. So suppose on our left side, we have some model that's changing over time. Um, so we just have some very simple linear model with an error term. Uh, and it's hard to see, but there is an exponentially weighted mean underneath these data points that is capturing that true, true relationship. Uh, and then we're also using an equal weight, which is this blue line. Uh, and our mean obviously can't keep up with that because this observation in this corner has the same weight as this thing over here. Um, so if our model is changing over time, um, obviously an equal weight uh, is, is going to perform poorly. Um, in contrast, if we have a constant model, our equal weight is going to perform better. So by the end of this, our, our blue line in here, which is our equally weighted mean, uh, we have a very nice um, uh, estimate. So this thing doesn't vary very much, uh, as opposed to our red line, which is our exponentially weighted mean. This thing is still kind of bouncing around a lot because the more recent observations are having high influence. Um, so these algorithms aren't a black box. You have to like, understand a little bit of the relationship behind your data before you're fitting things uh, or bad things can happen. And this is a very trivial case of just means. Um, but worse things can happen if you're fitting, I don't know, logistic regression or some kind of more complicated model that's changing over time. So every online stat has the following methods available. Uh, so there's a fit with an exclamation mark. Um, uh, so you give it an ob online stat object O and whatever the data looks like, and that will update that object in place. Um, knobs for getting the number of observations and value will return whatever the value is associated with that online stat. And that most types also have other methods available. So for example, this linear regression type, which does uh, exact linear regression, has a coefficient method. Um, and there's some things that are kind of hidden there. So online variance, you also have to calculate the online mean. So there's a mean method for the variance object and a few other things. But those are in the documentation. All right, so besides using weights, uh, there's, you have other control over how your objects get updated with new data. Um, so here is just a toy example. I have a vector of 100 random normals and a mean object. Um, so just to show that this is doing it online, I am giving this uh, object a new observation piece by piece through this vector and updating it. So that is one way we can update it is with some singleton observation. Uh, we can also give it that entire vector and this vector is essentially just calling this for loop. Uh, another option, so if we add an integer to our fit method, um, it's going to tell it to update in batches of size 10. So this doesn't really make sense for a mean with equal weight, uh, but this makes a big, uh, big impact on stochastic approximation stuff, which I'll show in a second. Um, we can also override the weight. So mean by default has an equal weight. Um, if I give it a float of 0.1, it's going to use 0.1 for each update, so essentially doing an exponentially weighted mean. Uh, and I, I can also give it a vector of weights to use. So if I give it a vector w, observation yi gets weight wi. 
So there's a lot of flexibility between the weight types and how you're updating things um, to control how new observations influence these objects. So why do we have so many updating methods? Um, so I think this is best shown through example. Um, so we're going to look at linear regression using stochastic gradient descent, uh, and we're going to look at the plot of the loss on a test set over time. So for example, let's look at this slice at 200 observations. So this is after finning 200 uh, observations of a training set, and this blue line is the, the loss on the test set over time. So just giving it the normal fitting method, um, this is what our thing looks like. So it's a little bit noisy, but it looks like it's reaching a minimum somewhere in there. Um, so people off, uh, so this is doing each, each row is uh, calculating a gradient, and then we're taking a step in that negative gradient. Um, so people often do batches for stochastic gradient descent. So here we're giving it a batch value of 10, and we can see that this is uh, quite a bit smoother. And then one other option, say I just want to override all the weights with 0 0.001, we can see that this is going to take a long time to learn, just because we've overrided these weights with really small weights. All right, so I'd like to talk about some of the algorithms that I'm using uh, in this package. So this is uh, essentially the, on, or the implementation version of my research. Um, so one of the things, the first things that I looked into was this online MM algorithm. Um, so I'll first describe what offline MM is. Uh, and it's more of a concept than an algorithm, but it stands for majorization minimization. Um, and the point of this is that suppose we have some objective function f, and it's really hard to minimize for whatever reason. Um, so instead of minimizing f directly, we're going to create a sequence of easier functions. Um, so we'll create some functions gt such that it's equal to our objective at our current estimate, uh, but it lies entirely above the objective everywhere else. So the EM algorithm is actually a specific case of MM. Um, and just to visualize what's going on here, um, hopefully, is that readable? All right. Uh, so say we're starting at some point theta old at this green spot. Uh, this blue line is our objective function. This red line is our majorizing function. Uh, and so we can see that by minimizing this red function, we move theta over to this purple line, um, and we're decreasing the objective function. But really, all we've done is find the minimum of some easier function to minimize. So we iterate through this process, and we keep moving in the direction of the minimum. And that's kind of the intuition behind MM. So for online or stochastic MM, <coughs> so we use a stochastic, stochastic approximation of that majorizing function. Um, so again, like I showed before, with online mean, so we get this kind of weighted average looking thing. Um, so we have this Q function, which is our overall stochastic approximation of these majorizing functions. And we iteratively kind of weight in uh, the value of a new majorizing function uh, of, of one new data point. Um, so we aggregate this majorizing function together, and then we get the minimum of that. So the way I categorized things before, this is one of the, the hard problems. So we're not calculating our theta directly. We're kind of aggregating some kind of sufficient statistics and quotes uh, from which we can calculate that theta. And so I'm using this algorithm um, to implement quantiles. So here is just a very quick example showing how this works. Um, so I'm generating 100,000 random normals. Um, I'm using a, the quantile MM type uh, to get 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.75 uh, quantiles. I'm giving it a batch size of 10 to run through this. Um, and then we can see that it's getting fairly close to the truth of the normal distribution there. Um, another one of the cooler, um, I guess, classes of algorithms um, I'm looking at is something called stochastic proximal Newton algorithms. Um, so just like last time, I'm going to have to go through the offline version first. So say we have our objective function is the sum of two things. So we get f of theta plus g of theta. Uh, and our f is just this kind of sum or this mean of functions. Uh, of fi's. And all these fi's are convex and differentiable, and our g is con convex also, but not necessarily differentiable. So lasso regression and logistic regression with a ridge penalty, all that stuff kind of falls under this framework. So proximal gradient method is minimizing this function. 
Um, so if we let u equals our old um, estimate, so we're leaving our g function the same. Uh, the only thing we're changing is we're adding this kind of a poor quadratic approximation of our f term. Um, so if it was a true quadratic approximation, we, have a, we would have a second derivative here, uh, but we're not using that. So essentially, we're choosing, well, we can have a gamma. So for a gamma small enough, this is a MM algorithm. Um, so you can see we're majorizing this f function and leaving g the same is essentially what we're doing. So we're iterating through this process of minimizing this. Uh, and proximal Newton method is just a slight change to this. Uh, so we're approximating the second derivative uh, with some matrix H. So in general, this makes this a lot harder of a problem. So most of the, or a lot of the time, uh, this H matrix is diagonal. And that makes things a lot easier. Now, stochastic proximal Newton. So now we're, we're just replacing that full gradient with some noisy gradient. So we had f, which was the mean of these functions, fi's before. Now we have used the fi's directly in this. Um, and so the process of this, so we're essentially using worse approximations as a mechanism for stabilizing these iterations. Um, and so my little visual for why this is working. So say this blue line is our kind of our noisy loss function that we just used. Our fi is this blue. Uh, so if we used a gamma, so a step size of 0.1, this red line, our majorizing function would be this red function here. So if we started at 1 and we minimize this red function, we move from, from 1 to 0.8. Uh, so if we use a smaller step size, a gamma of 0.01, our majorizing function is this green one here, and we only move a little bit away from 1. So the idea is by like, these increasingly like, bad quadratic approximations, like, ensure that we only move a little bit away from our parameter. Um, and so as these step sizes are decreasing to zero, our parameter is also moving less and less. So uh, many SGD-like algorithms can be considered stochastic proximal and Newton. Um, so some of the popular recent ones are Adagrad, Adadelta, Adam, Phobos, uh, and all those ones are essentially uh, stochastic proximal Newton. And so these algorithms are implemented with a type I'm calling StatLearn for statistical learning. Uh, so again, our offline objective function will look something like this. Um, so our objective is a sum of some model, which is an abstract type, <coughs> say linear regression, and a penalty, say something like lasso. So stat StatLearn is parameters by that model and penalty, and then also the algorithm and the weight, which we've already discussed. So the trace plot examples we looked at earlier, um, so that was L2 regression with no penalty and SGD. Um, so thanks to all of the really great stuff in Julia, like multiple dispatch and abstraction. Um, so with this one simple type, you can fit any combination of model penalty and algorithm. So this is linear regression, absolute loss, uh, Poisson logistic regression, uh, support vector machines, Huber loss, quantile regressions. Uh, with ridge, lasso, or elastic net penalties, uh, and using any variety of these algorithms here. So MMGrad uh, is an experimental algorithm that I'm working on for my research, but all these other ones are also implemented in there. So to revisit stochastic proximal Newton, essentially this model type is giving us our F, what our F should look like and what our gradient should look like. Our penalty is giving us what our G should look like. Our weight is giving us what our gamma should look like, and the algorithm is telling us what this H matrix should look like. Um, so because of all this really great abstraction stuff in Julia, I can kind of implement all these things at once, um, and it's really great. So this is, a, this is actually implemented in, well, I would say, uh, impressively few lines of code, and that's not to my, ben or not to my I don't know, boasting. Um, it's just some of the great features in Julia. So here I'm creating a StatLearn object. Say I have five predictors, uh, and I want to do logistic regression with Adagrad and a ridge penalty. Um, so that's what that looks like there for constructing it. So here I'm looking at uh, an example here. So this is just simulated data, but I'm generating a lot of it. So LinReg data is just a little function generating linear regression data. Um, so this X matrix, uh, our design matrix, is going to be 1 million by 500. So I have 500 predictors. This thing is about 4 gigs in size. Uh, and I'm going to plot the coefficients here. So the coefficients are just basically the lin space of negative 1 to 1. And there's 500 of those things. Now, the, the very fastest 
uh, linear regression solver that I've come across is in multivariate stats, uh, the multivariate stats package using the LLSQ function. Um, so if I run through this data using batches of size 1,000, um, and here I'm using linear regression <coughs> and a learning rate with 0.7, uh, I can run through that in about three seconds. Uh, multivariate stats runs through it in about 3.5. Um, now, these timings only really matter if my model is accurate. Um, so if we look at these things, so the max absolute difference between this online version and this offline version is 0 0.005. Uh, and so if you plot these two coefficients together, well, you can't see any difference because they're, they're arbitrarily close. Um, so that's, that shows one of the advantages of these online algorithms. Um, so you might have these huge data sets, uh, and you might be forced to only do an approximation, but if your approximation is arbitrarily close, uh, what's the difference? All right, so some of my future work for online stats. Um, so it assumes observations are in rows, uh, and this is inefficient with column major storage, but as Tim, Tim Holy talked about this morning, he may have already fixed this. Uh, so I may, may not have to re-implement anything. Uh, so this might already be done for me, uh, which would be great. Um, one thing I don't like is that it's not clear which of my types are using approximations versus which are exact. Um, I would like to add base merge methods in to allow for parallelization. Um, so say you can, you can fit um, linear regression on, I don't know, two different clusters on different data sets. How do you combine those two things afterwards? Uh, so I have to think through intelligent ways to like, combine stochastic gradient descent models. Uh, I'd like some easier plotting stuff, um, so I'll be looking at Tom's recipe stuff for plotting. Um, and then there's also quite a few, <coughs> excuse me, uh, experimental features in online stats. Um, things like uh, statistical bootstrapping and hyperlog log, log uh, and a few other things that could use some attention. Um, uh, and that is all I have for online stats. Thanks.